Um, thank you, David, and um, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Um, I do appreciate it, especially since you possibly could be enjoying a lovely afternoon, evening in the lovely Glasgow weather that we have today, which is beautiful sunshine. Um, as you can see from my presentation, I've tried to make it exciting because coal mining and coal is very black. And obviously I'm not against it as I wear a lot of black, but I was trying to sort of liven up the, the images and I tried to get a, a coal fire going as it were. Um, I don't know very successfully, but however, um, that's what I've, I'm going to be talking about obviously is coal mining and coal miners. Um, I think it's always difficult to speak to a group of people who probably know more than you do uh, as the speaker um, on about coal mining and coal miners and disability and accidents and injuries. But what the heck, I'm going to give it a go tonight. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to just um, talk about the things that I have found interesting when I started to do some work on coal miners and coal mining. Um, so, w without any further ado, I'll start now. Okay, industry marked men. However, there was no industry that marked men in the way that coal miners were marked. This most arduous of work left its mark on the men who worked at the seams in the black hell that epitomized coal mining in the period I'll be talking about this evening, 1920 to 1948. In this paper, I will discuss the men, the coal miners, and the way that their professional profession marked them physically and mentally. I'll focus on certain conditions, as the ways that the body can be marked by mining are myriad, and I do not have sufficient time to discuss them all in depth. So I've chosen a few as my focus, which reflect my own interests in blindness, rehabilitation, the relationship between physical disability and mental health, which is a kind of a new area I'm exploring with First World War amputation. And um, also looking at um, the question of um, environments, which I'm also interested in. I'm also interested in medical research in relation to minors, and I will be talking about that. The Medical Research Council investigated a number of conditions unique to mining, and I will focus on a couple of the reports, but I won't give you lots of screeds of information from boring reports. So why was the Medical Research Council so interested? And I think really in a lot of ways the answer is very simple. Coal mining was fundamental to the British economy. Millions of tons used every year in industry and domestically. Many thousands of men were needed and prior to the end of mining, um, brought about by the Thatcher government in the 1980s, had to get that in, millions of men passed through the mines and many of them bore the marks of their work until the day they died. In a survey of coal miners and their lives conducted on behalf of the Society of Friends in 1947, the interviewer asked an unnamed respondent in one of the many pit villages that were visited, and he said, why do most of them look so grim or rather so serious? And this is a quote of the short discussion that followed. Because life in the pits in the colliery village is serious. It is a hard struggle with certain defeat at the end, came the answer. Well, in the end, all men are defeated. I, meaning the interviewer, joked with them. We all end up, end up being worn out and weary in body and mind. And the answer comes, yes, but there is a difference between pit life and the work in the light, in the fresh air and in natural surroundings which do not constantly threaten you with danger. Can't you see for yourself the number of disabled men with amputated legs or arms or fingers or even blind or with twisted spines or necks or otherwise laid on their backs? It was noted by Keating um, in a book on mining that the miner will always remain subject to greater hazards than his brother in the factory. A report by the Medical Research Council stated that although the mortality rates of miners were relatively low, there were more occupational diseases um, subject to compensation, and compensation is something I'm going to mention later, um, than any other industry in the country. Um, as it was dangerous and arduous, Mining required a certain type of British man. I'm going to talk about them now. When we think of miners, we think of strong men, 
tough on the outside, with bodies that were honed through generations to endure the harsh conditions of mining. Coal miners created their own type of masculine identity. As Ross McKibben notes in his book, Classes and Cultures, coal face miners denied their work was monotonous and were heard to boast of the strength and skill of the amount of coal that they would be able to move or what they called tick off. McKibben goes on to argue that miners, like many working class men, were deeply involved in the workplace in a competitive type of male culture. The conditions, the proximity, and here we have some pictures of miners, um, the proximity and indeed the closeness to danger made miners part of a unique work culture that was in many ways closed to outsiders, even in other industries. Miners were imbued with certain emotional as well as physical characteristics. And I found, I found this very interesting. Bravery was associated with miners. Stories of rescues of fellow workers under great danger are familiar in miners' autobiographies. Even books on such relatively dry and serious topics, such as industrial medicine, pa praise the bravery of miners as if bravery were a necessary condition of being in the mines. One such book noted the tradition, and I quote here, the traditional bravery of the miner in the rescue of comrades when disaster overtakes the pit. However, alertness was seen more of a key trait to working in coal mines by miners. You hear this um, in some of the books I've been reading. An interviewee in 1922 noted, quote, those chaps who think about other things when they work in the pit soon get killed, end quote. Even when there were accidents, the men tended to be stoical and black-humoured about them. One autobiography described an incident where a miner lost his foot when a 28-pound sharp-edged stone of a lump of coal fell on his foot. And he says, this blasted coal, he complained, the damn stones here fall like lead. They do hit a chap so hard he could think his foot was off, I indeed. Di turned to look at his right foot and then gave a loud shout of, I go to hell, it is off too. I remember them placing the foot alongside Di on the stretcher and his complaint that he had bought that new pair of shoes only the week before. So because of his wooden leg, Di Jones became Di Peg. When George Orwell reported going down a coal mine in his book, The Road to Wigan Pier, in the late 1930s, he reported of men, the fillers, kneeling for hours while shoveling coal. And he said, it's a dreadful job they do, an almost superhuman job by the standards of an ordinary person. He went on to describe the miners' bodies, writing, it is only when you see miners down the mine and naked that you realize what splendid men they are. Most of them are small. Big men are at a disadvantage in that job. So somebody like David or me, for example, would be much too big to be a miner. Um, but nearly all of them have the most noble bodies, wide shoulders tapering to slender, supple waists, and small pronounced buttocks and sinewy thighs, with not an ounce of waist flesh anywhere. However, as McIver and Johnston note, quote, working in the pits helped create the masculine body, whilst holding the potential to emasculate with physical, hence earning, capacity undermined by traumatic injury and longer-term chronic illness and disability. Indeed, accidents were common and long-term disabilities were caused through the nature of the work. In 1946, the number of compensatable accidents in the Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire coalfield was um, 1,721. And I don't know if you, how well you can see this, but it gives um, some idea about the location, so-called the anatomy of an injury. And you can see where, um, you know, you can always see this later, um, where on parts of the body injuries did occur. The spaces in which miners worked also impacted on bodily integrity. The harsh environment shaped the ways that the body responded to it. As well as danger, conditions in coal mines were not subject to modern 20th century notions of cleanliness and very little regulation, although safety measures were in place, but whether they were enforced is another matter entirely and not really within the scope of what I'm going to talk about today. Through descriptions from writers such as Orwell, the contemporary British public could get some idea of the conditions in the mine.
Indeed, films such as Coal Face, which was released in 1935, also served to inform the British public about the conditions for miners. The film showed the reality of the conditions, there's some reality and some conditions, um, with men forced to work in cramped spaces in choking dust in the dark. In the 11 and a half minute film, the half-naked men working the coal face are shown with very dirty yet athletically muscular bodies. However, Coalface also provided the sobering statistics that over 450 miners were injured and maimed each day, and that one in five could be expected to be injured in their life. They also report that four miners a day were killed. These bodies, so carefully honed through hard work, were in constant danger of adopting the permanent marks from the dangerous business of coal mining, losing their health or indeed their lives to it. But what about prevention? And if we think about the 1930s, prevention is very much, uh, you know, sort of examined and, and people are very interested in the notion of preventing accidents, preventing illnesses, preventing um, disabilities. So I thought about prevention when I was writing this paper. And in this I mean prevention of injury and disability, not the safety regulations that were established in mines in an effort to prevent miners from losing their lives and also lowering the number of accidents. And how did miners with their masculine identity um, use protective equipment to prevent injury? Now I don't think in any of these images anyone is wearing a safety helmet, for example. They're wearing a cloth cap. Um, you know, and when I say injury, I mean both catastrophic injury and injuries that derive from long-term exposure to the vagaries and strains of coal mining. Personal safety equipment was gradually introduced for miners. Some were mass-produced and others were homemade, such as these knee pads um, for, um, to prevent beat knee. Um, still, by 1948, safety helmets were not necessarily a condition of employment, so it's actually hard to know, apart from looking at images, and uh, probably people in this group have, have maybe looked at that, um, if men wore them or not. They were made of wood, the helmets, and looked sort of like a pith helmet, and were technically worn, if people wore them, to protect the miner's head from falling lumps of coal um, as a protection from the, the roof of the coal mine. Knee pads and boots protected the lower parts of the legs. However, many injuries came to the spine as a result of roof falls that obviously fell on stooping miners. Efforts were made to ensure that levels of safety improved, however. The coal mine's general regulations, precautions against coal dust, 1939, endeavored to prevent the levels of coal dust affecting the miners. And coal dust affects miners in a number of ways, which I'll, 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 I'll talk about. In one discussion in the late 1940s, it was noted that miners did not always wear dust masks, even if they were provided. Of course, equipment differed from mine to mine, and provision uh, differs from mine to mine, pit head baths, etc., etc., all the kind of welfare services or cleaning services that were in some mines, they were all different. Um, but for prevention, you need compliance. You need the people who you're trying to protect to agree to be protected. And it would seem that some of these older industries, these dr industries with a long tradition, where men took pride in their work, that safety equipment was rejected as it reduced the notion of the skill factor inherent in their job. The lack of interest in personal safety equipment was not unique to mining, however. And I just want to highlight another example of a rejection of safety equipment in glass blowing, just to kind of give you a, a kind of a comparison. Um, there was a, a, a condition called um, glass workers cataract. And um, between 1908 and 1928, the glass workers cataract committee because they have one for everything and they name it after all the conditions, endeavoured to understand the mystery of the increased number of cataracts in the eyes of workers, particularly those involved in making glass bottles. Um, they conducted a lot of research on um, different kinds of light and how it affected the eye and devised 
protective eyewear for the men who were glass blowers to, to use. Workers refused to wear them. Um, the reduction in the incident of glass workers' cataract actually came about from the mechanisation of glass bottle manufacture in Britain. And I think we can sort of see this kind of reflected <coughs> in a lack of interest in, in safety equipment, especially with, with older workers. Um, although coal mining is a different industry from that of glass blowing, there was a disinclination on the part of some miners to adopt this new you know, new cleanliness regime such as, say, pit head baths, because in a lot of the older miners, they thought that it would cause rheumatism. Some of them thought they would get infections. Um, so this idea of prevention um, was not complied with often by, by workers. As coal mining was so fundamental to the British economy, it was in the interests of the mining companies and obviously also the state to ensure that miners remained healthy. The coal mines that dotted the countryside from the south of England to central Scotland fed a nation hungry for power to fuel its many industries. As noted in a report on the use of artificial sunlight in industry, it noted, the urgent demand for more coal and a growing public consciousness of the disproportionate hazards and of the grimness of the work and, in many cases, of the depressing surroundings of the miner. Um, to give to any project directed to improve his health or to brighten his existence, a publicity which tends to create prejudice in an inquiry of this kind. Coal was vital to Britain's economy. Indeed, as Michael Dinterfass notes, this idea of the public um, being interested in the welfare of, of coal miners because, they, because coal mining is so fundamentally important. Um, and Dinf, um, Dintenfass suggests ownership on behalf of the public of the mines, even before they were, they were nationalised. And therefore, any threats to miners' safety reflected the public's interest in their flagship industries. Coal mining was large scale with many mines all around the country. So large numbers of people could see or identify with the importance of the industry to the British economy. So the health of miners, as we can see by this range of physical therapy offered to them, was extremely important. And I'm sorry, that um, um, picture on your um, left-hand side with a um, masseuse massaging a man when he's wearing a towel looks slightly dodgy, but um, I trust me, I got it from an acceptable source. <laughs> In addition to the risks presented on a daily basis to coal miners associated with the danger of working underground, the specter of severe and often permanent medical conditions were caused by working in a dangerous environment, and it hung over the miners. They were not a result of sudden catastrophic incidents. Instead, they were the result of long-term repetitive work and exposure. Rheumatic diseases and respiratory diseases could not be seen, but their impact was certainly felt. I'm not going to talk very much about miner's lung, as we have Arthur here. <laughs> And um, he, had, he and Ronald Johnson wrote a wonderful book on miner's lung, and you have that to refer to, so I'm not going to talk about that today. Rheumatism was attributed to excessive high and low temperatures, um, and that was blamed for the, the, the increase in rheumatics um, in miners. Um, in a book called Recent Advances in Rheumatism, which sounds very exciting, and believe me, it was, in 1937, it was suggested that one of the ways that the impact of rheumatism could be lessened was through the use of protection against high and low temperatures, which is obviously going to be extremely difficult in a mine. Um, um, an increase in living conditions an improvement in living conditions, and reduction in hours from the seven and a half hour shift to the six hour shift. The Empire Rheumatism Council, they've got some great names, advised that colliery companies establish specialist centers for the treatment of rheumatism in minors. Other conditions included beat knee and beat elbow and beat hand. Um, this is the vernacular name for subcutaneous cellulitis. Of and uh, I'll give you that one. Um, although the total number of cases did not exceed that of minor's nystagmus, 
which I'll talk about shortly in the 1920s, it was still a cause for concern as the number of cases of beat elbow were nearly as common, apparently, as that of lead poisoning, which apparently was quite common. <laughs> Um, in 1924, the Medical Research Council produced a report on minors' beat hand, beat knee, and beat elbow, and it said, the evidence established that septic inflammation of the knee, hand, and elbow occurred among coal miners and other manual workers, and that it resulted from infection of tissues previously affected by chronic traumatism. The report goes on to say, the trauma was ascribed in the case of the knee to constant kneeling, especially while getting coal in thin seams. In the case of the hand, to the use of the pick, especially on hard coal, coal or rock, or when the palms of the hands are soft after a period away from work. And in the case of the elbow, to the position assumed by miners when under holing. And there's a, a very swollen hand on your left that is beat hand. Uh, you can see curvature of the hand um, of a minor, and that is an elbow. You can see the cellulitis on the outside there. The problem was obviously not the minor's joints, but the minor's skin. As minuscule particles got under the skin, they abraded and caused infection. Dermatitis was another condition which marked the bodies of minors. There were two distinct types, apparently, identified by um, people who worked in industrial medicine. The friction dermatitis, which tended to congregate in the groin and other areas where the skin was rubbing against each other. The other type was sensitization, which was caused by irritating dust on the skin. So you can see the dust does not just affect the lungs, but it also affects the skin. Um, some reports suggested that this was because miners weren't very clean, but um, upon examination, they found that obviously the dirt was ingrained in the skin. Indeed, miners retained permanent marks just because of the work they did. One report in 1947 focused on the blue scars on the miners' hands, faces, um, and particularly the nose and forehead. Some older miners were said to be very proud of the blue scars whereas younger miners regularly scrubbed their skin in the pit head baths. About 55% of mines at this time were said to contain the pit head baths, um, although parts of the Northwest and South Wales were said to be poorly supplied with pit head baths. Other marks that miners wore on the, their skin on a permanent basis were called the buttons down the back, which were the scabs along the backbone where the miner would bump into the roof on the mine. Other conditions could manifest themselves, and eyes were very vulnerable to conditions caused by unhealthy healthy environments in the mines. And obviously this ties in with my interest in blindness, um, so I have done a bit of work on this. The most common problem was with, with eyes, and it was called miners nystagmus, known more commonly as miners blindness. Nystagmus was widespread in Europe and Britain, yet not prevalent in the United States. It was unique to underground workers, and the average age of its onset was 45. Explanations for the condition concluded that as it affected coal miners working at the coal face and not other workers, it was deemed to be owing to, quote, unrelieved blackness of the coal, end quote. The condition was first noted in the 1830s, and by 1875, a paper had been published called Miners Nystagmus, A New Disease, its symptoms were progressive and included the failure of night vision followed by headaches and a severe reduction in overall vision. By 1920, 2,865 cases had been identified and certified. Miners had little idea what the condition was called. One report in 1922 said that one miner who was interviewed call it, called it eye stagmus not nystagmus, so they're insulting as well. Symptoms included loss of sight, night blindness, and the night blindness was so bad for some men that when they came off a shift at night, their wife or children had to meet them and lead them home. Um, they had a photophobia, slowness in adapting to the dark, oscillations of light or objects looked at, defective vision, headaches, and vertigo. 
There are also psycho, what were called psychoneurotic symptoms, which I'll discuss, that were associated with it, that I'll discuss um, when I talk about mental health. The onset of nystagmus was usually slow, although some people got it quite quickly. Therefore, the condition was largely preventable if the minor was removed from the darkness of the mind for a certain period, um, often up to a year. It was argued that for blindness to be permanent, the minor would have, ha would have to suffer from the condition for about 25 years. So the disruption to production that minor's blindness caused was very costly to the state. The Times reported in 1920 that it cost over one million pounds a year, nystagmus did. Such were the concerns that in come the Medical Research Council, they were asked to prepare a report on minor's nystagmus. They in the, the interestingly named Minor's Nystagmus Committee um, investigated the causes and endeavoured to alleviate the condition. The committee made three reports in 1922, 1923 and 1932. Um, it's in, it's, um, it first members included J.S. Haldane, Professor E.L. Collis, T.L. Llewellyn, G.H. Pooley and for me the most interesting one, W.H.R. Rivers. For me, Rivers' appointment to the committee was very much the most interesting because, as people know, his work was principally devoted, and here we have a picture of him, um, to the study of shell shock in the First World War, and he rang Craig Lockhart near Edinburgh for officers suffering from neurasthenia. The most famous patient was probably Siegfried Sassoon. For Rivers to be involved meant that there was a strong theory that nystagmus was not a wholly physical condition. And it must have been extremely important and in a very important committee if WHR Rivers was involved in it. However, Miner's nystagmus turns out to be mostly about lighting. The first report published in 1922 um, concluded, and there's some um, pictures of illuminated mines. This is a mine in Kent on the right hand side um, and you can see it's, it's lit brightly and they say in the um, blurb below the picture that it's lit like Piccadilly Circus. Um, and um, the deficient illumination is due to the low illuminating power of the safety lamps generally used by coal miners which was one of the um, conclusions of the committee. In addition to the effect of coal dust or dirt in obscuring the lamp glasses, the choking of wire gauze chimneys and the presence of moisture or low oxygen percentage in mine air all reduce the light given by oil lamps while failing voltage, poor bulbs or lack of proper attention have similar effects on the illumination given by electric lamps. So poor lighting was agreed to be the overarching cause. In the 1935 film Coalface, the narrator compares the merits of the Davy safety lamp and the electric light. So they do talk about this in this film. It was noted that although the electric light was brighter, the Davy safety lamp, which emitted a feeble light, but it also had the benefit of warning the miner to the presence of gas. Commenting on this first report in 1922, the Departmental Committee on the Causes and Prevention of Blindness, which is another group, noticed, uh, noted sorry, that there were 7,028 cases reported in 1920 alone, and the cost, cost of compensation was um, lower than the time suggested at about £300,000. So, but it was important for whatever your figures were, that uh, minor's nystagmus be controlled or prevented. Now, there are obviously a few problems with this. There are problems for the economy, but there are also problems for the miners. The danger that a man with poor vision presented in the mine could be catastrophic, not just for the econ economy, but for the safety of other miners. One doctor from a mutual insurance company, the Times reported, examined 41 miners with nystagmus to ascertain if they could see the fire damp cap which shows gas to be present in the mine. Only four men detected it correctly and 16 completely failed to see it. Gas explosions, obviously, as you know, were one of the major causes of the deaths of miners, so nystagmus was actually a real threat to mine safety. 
Interestingly, nystagmus, which is pretty much prior to 1939, was also regarded as an occupational neurosis. Um, as noted by Keating in 1948, the hazardous nature of the miner's occupation, which the miner knows to be dangerous, cannot be overstressed. The eye symptoms may be looked upon as a breakdown in the face of the conflict. Uh, initially, I thought there was a breakdown in the face, and I thought that was terrible. But a breakdown in the face of the conflict between the desire for self-preservation and the need for earning a livelihood, and as such, comparable to other conditions which may be of a physiological nature, such as night blindness. Many men with nystagmus were forced to work on the surface. This could prove problematic for the family that he might be supporting, or usually was supporting, as there were relatively few jobs on the surface, so often there was no work, and the miner would have to go on the dole, which was often a reduction in weekly payments from about 29 shillings to 15 shillings um, in about the late 1930s, so it, it would be relative. Working on the surface was often seen as a form of rehabilitation, and miners and colliery owners saw this as a short-term measure, and that eventually the miner would be able to return to work underground. This period of incapacity, which didn't necessarily mean a miner wasn't working, um, could last a few weeks um, to several years. Other treatments for this condition of nystagmus was um, fresh air, which is, which is sort of every cure in, in, in sort of the 1930s in Britain uh, it, it in some way involves air. Fresh air, good food, and ultraviolet light. Um, however, these didn't really work all that well, and it was noted that these results have been disappointing, except so far as the general tonic effect is concerned. It did not help necessarily with the nystagmus, with improving the nystagmus. The eyes were vulnerable, not only to conditions such as nystagmus. Miners' eyes were also vulnerable to infection. In 1939, A.J. Rhodes tested the types of bacteria in the, the, um, the, the eye sacs of 658 miners. So coal miners were often experimented on, which I think is interesting. Um, they appeared to be healthy, um, but he found a number of pathogenically uh, potentially pathogenic organisms, including pneum um, streptococcus and pneumonococcus. Some mining companies endeavored to wipe out this potential infection using preventative methods. In 1943, in some Scottish collieries, um, um, sulfacetamide drops were inserted in the eye, which resulted in a drastic reduction in the number of cases of eye infections. But eye infections were a very common um, aspect of, of life in Britain um, for most people. Um, we also must not forget, and I want to turn now to the emotional impact of mining. And this is an area where I found out things that um, I thought were some of the most interesting. Anyway, you can be the judge of that. Um, in the survey conducted by the Society of Friends, which I mentioned at the beginning of the paper, it was said that men of a nervous type quickly get nystagmus or some other sort of neurasthenia and their restlessness infects others. A similarity was drawn between the men and the highly strung ponies who are also said to be useless in the pits. Um, you know, there's been some um, work done on the impact of disability obviously on the war wounded and um, there have also been a great number of books written about shell shock. But I, I think we often fail, I mean, apart from um, obviously um, Vicky Long's work, we fail to think about mental health in relation to industry, and I'm pleased that, that Vicky is here. Um, and although it's said that many of the doctors who treated miners were well aware of the strain of mining, or you know, perhaps a better term might have been suspicious of, of miners' emotions, um, similarly to doctors in the First World War, medical practitioners in the coal mining industry felt that in some cases the men exaggerated the effect of their illness or indeed the physical symptoms of any given condition, particularly nystagmus, were actually a problem of the mind. Um, perhaps they said a domestic worry or anxiety regarding employment. And. Um, this was noted about nystagmus. 
It has been stated that during the closing down of pits, either by strikes or for other reasons, or during great periods of unemployment, the number of certified cases greatly increases. And it has been stressed that this is due to the fact that nystagmic miners, who would work if employment was good, stimulate incapacity in order to gain compensation. So compensation, again, is, is an issue. Indeed, many miners were fearful that they would permanently lose their sight through nystagmus. Um, and the committee um, on the, minor, the Miners Nystagmus Committee noted in 1922 um, that they believed that they would have permanent disability and permanent blindness. Um, and obviously, it was not necessarily the case and had caused a lot of mental suffering. So this, again, was attached to the condition of nystagmus. Um, minors obviously feared they would not be able to work and support their families if they were blind. Now, given that much of the fiscal support for compensation was provided by the collieries, it is hardly surprising that disabled or injured miners experience high levels of anxiety. In his report for the first Miners Nystagmus Committee, so W.H.R. Rivers does one report for the Miners Nystagmus Committee, because of course he dies um, very, very soon in the early 1920s. Um, he identifies the similarity of the symptoms of general tremor, rapid heartbeat, excessive sweating, abnormal anxiety, depression, forebodings, apprehensions, and disturbing dreams. He thinks they're like shell shock. And he says that it is the same thing, that they are very similar. Shell shock and minor's nystagmus are connected. As far as Rivers seems to be concerned, the underground environment was similar to that of the trenches during the war. There was the constant threat of injury or death. It was pervasive and threatening, and the men experienced many hours of difficult working conditions in a challenging environment. Even some of the features that we associate so strongly with the First World War, such as rats, were also present in the mines. One miner's autobiography noted, Quote, the rats are hungry and daring, end quote. Um, and here I've got an image of, it's very hard to see the wording, but one on the left is an extreme case of photophobia. The other one is mental depression in minor's nystagmus. Um, the person who carried out the research was one Dr. Edison, and he worked with miners in Staffordshire, South Wales, and Yorkshire. And his investigations led him to two conclusions. First conclusion was the nystagmus is the beginning, and the anxiety state comes from the symptoms. And, this, and the second one was the psychoneurotic symptoms are primary or more prominent than the eye problem. So it was basically both. Nystagmus became an all-encompassing term that became attributable to a range of symptoms. Yet it was also stigmatizing because of its association with mental weakness and a lack of fortitude. Many miners hid their inability to see um, and potentially made their physical and no doubt their emotional condition worse. Um, it was noted by the committee that many symptoms were withheld for the fear of ridicule. Yet, these miners were not a bunch of work-shy Jessies. Rivers agreed. Rivers argued that it was not necessarily that miners did not want to work, more that the recognition of the condition of nystagmus enhanced its tendency to become the nucleus of his psychoneurotic symptoms. In fact, Rivers still prescribed an improvement in the lighting in mines as he noted that it was still the most important way that nystagmus could be prevented. Um, his reason for this was actually because he believed that men who could not see well had an increased sense of danger, which enhanced any psychoneurotic symptoms. So it wasn't entirely just sort of a physiological, better light, they can see more and they don't strain their eyes. Other authors agreed that lighting in the mines strained mental health. 
In 1937, Ling noted that work in inadequate light led to a sense of chronic irritation manifesting itself in discontent, a high labor turnover, and a high sickness rate. And obviously absenteeism is very um, important to the collieries to try and reduce the numbers of, of absentees. However, the mental health of minors and the comparison with shell shock continued to be made. The third report continued to reiterate Rivers' argument from 1922, 10 years later in 1932, drawing further comparisons with shell shock. It said not only in the similarity of many of the symptoms, but also in the circumstances under which it appears. The arduous nature of the work, the ever-present element of danger, especially in safety lamp pits, and the fear of incapacity are circumstances common to both disabilities, and they are the very circumstances in which an anxiety state is easily set up. I want to go slightly further with the war comparison, partly because it's 2014 and um, it's the 100th um, anniversary of the start of the First World War. And I think what was interesting for me and what struck me as someone who has worked on war is that similar to that of pensions for the war wounded after the First World War, the effect of what might be termed compensation culture, um, as we would think of it now, dominated the discussion surrounding nystagmus. So that's kind of like a yet a sort of a historical continuum. Um, the 1932 report of the Miners Nystagmus Committee reported quite boldly that the first committee had hoped that knowledge of the facts and arguments expressed in their reports might lead to the introduction of measures which would prove successful in diminishing the already considerable amount of compensation which was being paid. And I think that that is, is sort of also the crux of, you know, kind of sometimes state intervention, business intervention. And I think that this idea about you know, kind of medical practitioners working to ensure that compensation was limited has some echoes of that of the state and um, the First World War, particularly in shell shock cases. But anyway, we can discuss that. Many men lost friends and family members in accidents. It was agreed that grief and indeed the stress of working could have a severe impact on a minor. And these emotions were expected given the strong bonds between the men. However, if the stress and strain of working in mines was manifested in a physical condition such as nystagmus, the miner was viewed with all the suspicion that the shell shocked of the First World War were. And I think now I'm just gonna sort of say something by um, way of conclusion. I was thinking also about uh, commemoration and the interesting way that the dead are commemorated and thought about in mining accidents, and also the way that we commemorate the dead in the First World War. And I think that that's sort of another thing we could maybe discuss when we're having our dinner or something. And I think that that would be, it would be interesting to hear from, from the group um, if they've done any work on that. So, to say something by way of conclusion, and these are more of observations that I've made since I started to think about coal mining and disability. And I do talk about it a bit in my book on rehabilitation, but obviously not very much. Most of what I remember reading about coal mining when I was an undergraduate, which was many, many years ago, believe me, was political and economic. Basically, strikes and production numbers. Um, there's also more now about class and very interesting work on the community and gender. All of these subjects have been and continue to be fundamental to the study of mining, and all of them are still very interesting. What I have discovered in my reading around mining is there is so much more. Welfare, medical care, therapy, concern from the public, surrounding conditions for the miners, everything that David also talked about, um, you know, the literary um, constructions, things like that. I think they're absolutely fascinating. Um, they're unique ways to understand coal mining in Britain. I hadn't really thought about nystagmus, beat hand, elbow and knee, rheumatism and other conditions associated with being down a mine. And it forced me to think less about catastrophic accidents, crushed bodies and bones, which is what I kind of had in mind when I started doing the research for this. 
These conditions born of a long corporeal association with mining are what fascinated me. The interesting aspect for me was the impact on the body of long association um, and regular exposure within a specific environment and the way that spaces and how people work within them can tell us something. So what I really want to do at the end of this paper is to commend this research group on coal mining for no doubt really adding to our knowledge about this industry in Britain. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Julie, for a fascinating paper. It really does um, resonate with uh, many of the themes that we're looking at in uh, this uh, project. Um, we've got um, a little time for um, questions. Um, could I, while people gather their thoughts, could I ask you, I mean, you talked a lot about mental health and the mental health impact of um, physical conditions on minors themselves. And what's the much... Um, discussion of the um, impact of minors' physical and mental health on their families, because um, clearly these issues have a profound impact on families of uh, disabled people as well as uh, people themselves. Mm, I think in the reading I did, there were certainly um, things on minors' wives which were really fascinating, and the effect of, of, of the minor as central to family life. Um, so no doubt, um, I did. I, 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 there's a f uh, quite a few things I didn't put in here. Things like um, a minor who was paralysed, who George Orwell goes to see, and he's flat on his back, and he was actually a surface worker, and I don't know, some doctor had obviously st done something to him, or he had a, a, some condition that, you know, it's, it's impossible to tell what it might have been, and he'd been um, paralysed for 11 years and his children had been taken away from him and his mum had had to come back to look after him because his wife had died. So, I mean, these kind of issues for families, I think, are fundamental and very important and really interesting. And the problematic is that, I mean, I did see a lot of books about mines and they did talk about the families, miners, in their autobiographies. And then also in, um, there's a few books about um, mining women, you know, as in wives. So there is stuff out there, I just couldn't sort of manage to squash it in, but I m would imagine you have, um, going, you're doing something about that because it is so fundamental to, um, you know, the lives of disabled people, the people around them. Thank you, Julie. I really enjoyed your paper and um, actually Victoria and I are working on nystagmus and its psychological dimensions. It's so exciting to hear about <laughs> it from another perspective and, um, ah, brilliant, because we're puzzling over the decline of my stagnant. So I've got a couple of questions for you. One about that and one that picks up on other themes that you raised in your really interesting paper. What do you think actually leads to that decline in my stagnant in the post-war periods? We start to see this tail off in cases. Do you think it's about better lighting or do you think it's about psychological dimensions? Or do you think it's about the reconfiguration of workmen's compensation legislation? We're still having an ongoing debate between ourselves about that. Um, and the other one I think is really interesting and often overlooked these conditions like rheumatism and dermatitis which coexist within the workplace and beyond the workplace and they're almost in this kind of boring conditions but yet have a real impact affect a large number of workers. Do you, in your own kind of preliminary research on this and your research more broadly, do you think these conditions are neglected in favour of the occupational disorders? Do they attract the same attention? Um, I think it's a really interesting question that you're raising with that. Yes, I, mean, I, I would agree on the first, part, first question, uh, yes, <laughs> all of them. <laughs> I, think it's, um, I think there are changes to lighting. We see this, as it, because I've been working on blindness, mm -hmm. I've sort of looked at up to 1950, but sort of not further, that there, I, there are changes to, to this idea about how light things have to be and also different ways of cutting coal so different kinds of processes that that happen um, I think that that sort of it, it's a kind of a conglomeration of things so I think you you know you've ticked every every single box compensation changes um, but I think you know I think mostly it's it's to do with you know this this idea of changing safety 
aspects in the workplace as well. Um, and, and also, I, um, you know, because of safety measures, maybe the, the miners are less stressed. And so this is, is may have something to do with it. Because I mean, if you, you think about the Second World War, if we think about um, problems with um, 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 you know, mental health problems that result from the war, they're every bit as high in terms of, of people leaving the army as it is in the First World War. But we just ha no one's really picked that up. So you know, it's ki th that is kind of hidden. So you know, it's a, I think it's a big Gordian knot you're going to have to try and untangle. And I've so far in my book, which hasn't come out yet, have not probably at all. So, and answering that question in such a long way, I've forgotten the first, I've forgotten number two. Yeah. Just remind me of the. Um, I was, you were talking about rheumatism. Yes. And oh, those things. Neglected occupational conditions. So I, I was really delighted that you yep. mentioned them. And I, I kind of wondered where you felt that sit within, for example, the Medical Research Council's agenda. But the other thing I wanted to mention is that I know one of our colleagues has found that a lot of discharged soldiers from first World War sent into the mines. Yes, but yeah, yep. yep. And Bevan boys and things like that. Oh yes, yeah, they're they in they go, um, and that may have actually had an impact on conditions in mining as well because when they went down, it was quite shocking um, the, con the, the the conditions in in the mines. But I think there is so much to be done on you know kind of occupational diseases of what I call the 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 small and in unimportant variety because dermatitis can make your life a living hell, especially if you don't have. Um, you know, medication to control it in the same way asthma does prior to, to you know, asthma kill, I mean, asthma still kills people, but, you know, things like, um, you know, um, ulcer, you know, how debilitating without medication an ulcer, stomach ulcer can be. So, but these things like itchy skin, painful skin, you know, them dipping their hands in water, warm water at night to try and, you know, bend them out and things like that. I think that's, you know, I think it's much more important than, you know, we do tend to look at the headline accidents. Mm -hmm. And I think you're absolutely right. And I think to look at things like dermatitis, rheumatism, aches, pains, chronic conditions is actually going to tell us quite a lot. So I think that that's, that's really exciting that, that someone's doing some work on that and that, you know, you guys are thinking about that as well. Question in the back. Thanks very much. You're Hello, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a question and a comment about masculinity. Um, the comment is that for some strange reason, perhaps because uh, some of my ancestry goes through uh, the maritime provinces of Canada, I often think of coal, mi coal mining in parallel with fishing as terrible occupations that we were basically stuck with. And sometimes I think about, well, which one would I have preferred? And being stuck in the middle of a mine, a hot, cramped mine, you know, and dealing with the industrial hazards therein, or being stuck on a, you know, pitching, reeling fishing boat in the middle of the cold at Atlantic, freezing your butt off, and, you know, the accidents and, and chronic difficulties that would be inherent with that. And I wonder, and this might be a question for the, the, the project, the British Coal Fields Project as a whole, is, you know, comparing other industries where you have similar chronic uh, diseases, but also, you know, just in the last week we've had, I think up in Aberdeenshire, there was a, a fishing boat that went missing, and then of course we've had the coal mining uh, disaster in, uh, in, in uh, Turkey. So, you know, you have this combination of accidents and chronic disease. So, I'm wondering what masculinity and comparing the two perhaps. My question has to do with um, mechanization. My, my son and my dad and I went down to the Scottish Coal Mining Museum a few months ago, and it struck me how, in the bits that they let you in, how mechanized it is, and how, you know, the degree to which mechanization changed, you know, the, the image of a miner in terms of, you know, we're not doing all this by hand anymore. You know, there's dynamite, there's, there's and all the safety mechanisms that are in place as well, the, the big, you know, um, uh, uh, hydraulic, um, pistons that are used to hold up the mine and or hold up the, the walls of the mine and everything. And just I wonder as, as as mines become increasingly mechanized and less of a manual labor type environment, if that changes uh, how miners see themselves as you know real men. Well, I think that 
for me, there's this notion of what I call traditional masculinity in industry. That because this type of work has always been seen as essentially masculine, because we also have to think, and, and this comes from the relationship between um, the types of work that men do, you know, um, um, things like um, even working in an office, perhaps, or working in other areas. This type of technology affects, and, and progress, if you want to call it that, um, affects different occupations in different ways. So even though mining may be mechanized, it is still more masculine than perhaps going to an office or selling clothes in a shop, even though you might have, say, tills that work things out for you or something like that. that is, it's, it's almost like a comparative type of traditional masculinity as, as I see it. I'm trying to sort of think about how I'm going to develop this notion of masculinity. And I was thinking about it on the train up. And I was thinking why, and I was actually thinking about why, with mechanization, is mining still considered you know, strong? And I think it's also associated with danger. Mm -hmm. Danger is very masculine, apparently. Um, well, who knew? Yes, of course it is. <laughs> masculinity is dangerous and <laughs> danger is masculine. I don't know. But yeah, I think that that's also the question. We think of, you know, we think of men in the military, we think of them as, as ex being exposed to danger, so we think of them as masculine. So I think working with machinery can be incredibly dangerous. So I think that that's also where it, it comes in. Response to the last comment is that uh, you could the comment that it was more dangerous for a woman to give birth to a first world war than to a Soviet War. True. Anyway, um, absolutely. That was the question I was going to ask. Um, I was a little interested in Jordan and Claire's thoughts, but I, there was something that puzzled me a little, which is that it seems to me that you said very little about unemployment. Mm -hmm. And if one were asked to think of a single thing that is associated with coal mining in for Britain, it would probably be unemployment. Mm -hmm. And the reason that seems to me to be important is because your, it seems to me that your, your model for explaining why there is so much interest in mines health in this period is the economic importance of coal mining. But in many ways, coal mining is becoming less economically important in Britain in this period. And therefore, it seems to me that there ought to be other explanations for why the health of coal mining is getting so much attention. Well, I mean, if you sort of look at how much, I mean, what was it, 40 million tons in 1935, sort of in the early part of the 1930s, just 40 million tons of coal is used for domestic purposes. And then you think about what's used in industry, which is something like 72 million tons. I mean, there's still a lot of coal about. You know, whether or not mechanization changes the nature of employment in the same way that disability can make, make a minor unemployed, obviously. And, we, and if you think about things, like even in the 1970s, when um, we, you know, we have the, the winter of discontent and stuff and coal miners strikes, the, the strike of coal miners, you know, historically in Britain, I think, and I mean, I am no, in no way a labor historian, so, you know, I'm a medical historian, is... I think, you know, sort of fundamental to the psyche of the nation in a lot of ways. And it's not to say just because something is believed doesn't mean it's necessarily true, of course, as we know. But I think that that kind of construction of the importance of coal mining in this country, um, and we, you know, think about the coal miners' um, strikes in the 1980s and the dismantling of, of coal mining um, as an industry in the 1980s, you know, the, the reaction that that caused in the country and the divisiveness say something about the public's attitude, I think, towards coal mining, which is kind of what I was trying to talk about. Mm. Yeah, that's a question. Um, I really enjoyed that, Julie. Thanks very much. It's a subject on which I know less than other than Dr. H. Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have one very straightforward question, which you can, if you don't mind, answer secondly, which is, what caused my stiffness? But you could come back to that, because I guess that's a one sentence answer. <laughs> okay. So, but hopefully. Um, oh, well, I don't know. <laughs> I think I might need to talk to, to <laughs> these two over here. <laughs> but what I was wondering, both in terms of Rivers' involvement in, in the Committee of Inquiry, and just generally, uh, speaking to Vicky about 
unfortunate minors who committed suicide by drinking down these awful deep shafts. That's awful. It would, my <laughs> horror would be to descend in one of these lifts. And I'm just wondering, did minors have ways of dealing of, of medically or, or otherwise assisting each other if somebody suffered from a sudden attack of claustrophobia, which I presume some minors must have sure they, yeah, or sure they do. seasoned minors must have found eventually the stress intolerable. Did it always, did that kind of, of uh, breakdown be a temporary or, or permanent? Was it dealt with literally on the ground by the minors themselves who presumably would have had experience of of that kind of thing happening, or did it become medicalized? And in other words, you know, was the affected minor lifted out and processed through the, the medical system in some kind of other? And were the connected the sort of connections you're drawing between First World War shell shock um, or shell shocked soldiers? Are the comparisons to be drawn between claustrophobic minors who may exhibit what some might describe as hysterical symptoms? Would, would they have been paralleled by people like Rivers at the Wickham? In my reading so far, and probably there are many more people who could probably say more about this than I can, in my reading so far, I only see people being taken out when they're physically injured on stretchers in all the work that I've looked at. I've not seen anyone removed for an emotional problem. Now, this could just mean because I haven't read enough and, and there are other people who've read a lot more than I have. So, um, but I, I've seen lots of pictures of people being taken out on stretchers when they've, rocks have fallen on them and things like that. But I haven't seen people being taken out in maybe a hysterical condition. Perhaps other minors, older minors, calmed people down. There was a great sense because you had to rely on the, the other people um, who were in your group that, you know, there's a, there's a, a great sense in a lot of ways of a, a strong camaraderie, a strong sense of, you know, a kind of a, sort of a, a very kind of jokey masculine one, you know, and, and not showing your, your feelings and, you know, stiff upper lip is not limited to the upper classes. So, you know, I think that that was also something that, that was, you know, actively encouraged. So I haven't seen it, but that's not to say that, that it doesn't exist, and I think it's a, it's a really interesting point. I mean, I was very surprised when I saw W.H.R. Rivers um, making a report. I mean, I'm glad he didn't die before he got to do his report, actually, because I think what he said was very interesting. Um, but I, I thought the reasons for his interest in minors nystagmus and also the culture surrounding shell shock um, in you know, men coming back from the First World War was a very, very interesting one. Um, and, you know, and, and this idea, because, you know, we always think of the men who are shell-shocked as a very separate and important group, and historians have written about them in that way. And the idea that it's connect it could be connected to industry, and it, it kind of separates the industrial and war disabled, again, from the civilians, mm -hmm. and it kind of moves them into that next that middle ground where they exist in. So I think that, and I didn't think that that was actually the case with their emotional health. I thought it might just be the case with their physical health. So that's, that's interesting. Miner's nystagmus. Nice <laughs> um, pretty much they decide it's caused by basically working in basically the dark in a dusty place um, with very, very poor lighting. Um, that just the strain of it. Some men get it quite quickly. Other men, um, very few get it quite quickly, but there are some, some that do. But most men get it from prolonged exposure, so that's sort of telling you something about the working conditions, the environment. So it's you know, a, a, a giving an all-encompassing sort of um, symptom, it's the environment. <laughs> <laughs> a question from Thank Steve. Yeah, I mean, I'm too am interested in the kind of links that you were drawing between the First World War uh, and these industrial sort of uh, victims that um, <coughs> I mean, I've seen the kind of link drawn in another kind of context in that is in the 1920s and then into the 30s and 40s as well. Uh, Miners trade union leaders are making that kind of parallel. Um, they're sort of describing, they're using all sorts of military or warfare metaphors then to discuss the injured members that they're representing. And they're sort of describing underground work as you know, war in which there is no armistice, uh, in which the miners are always in the trenches, um, 
So, you know, the, they do this obviously for rhetorical purposes. They try to elicit some of the sympathy that is directed towards veterans for their own mining members. Um, but they're also very, very bitter uh, that all the attention and resources are going to go into these uh, military veterans and not being devoted to uh, these industrial uh, victims as well. Um, so that's kind of interesting then that you know, the, 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 um, those links are made in this other kind of context. Um, but, but it does sort of beg the question, similar to what Bernard was asking then, about uh, the drivers behind um, the increased attention and research and intervention in the 20s, from the 20s onwards. Um, and I wonder the extent to which trade union pressure is being brought to bear and is causing some attention to, uh, to be placed on these things, or whether there are uh, other kinds of imperatives within the kind of medical and scientific research uh, spheres that is driving this. I think it's both, but I can probably only speak to one of them with any um, sense of knowing what I'm talking about, basically. Um, if we think about the nature of business industry in throughout the 1920s and 1930s, we have to think about things like time and motion studies, the, the, um, the way that businesses um, are, are, are meant to be economically viable. So I guess I'm saying something about the economics and the medicalization that is required in order to kind of construct this, this economic um, model of, of business in a way, or, or industry. So I think that, you know, kind of using the Medical Research Council, they do a lot of things on um, industry. They do a lot of studies on industry, trying to make industry more efficient, trying to protect the workers. And this is also about their expertise as well for certain types of, of workers. It's like in the Second World War, um, the RAF were very keen on making sure that not just pilots had a very high standard of rehabilitation, but that um, fitters and mechanics who worked on, things like, uh, worked on planes like Spitfires also had good rehabilitation because they were so fundamental to the war effort because they had such a sense of knowledge. And so I think that that is also um, in some cases, not all cases of industry, but in some cases um, it is part of it. And also the 1930s is a big time when it's all about prevention. They realize that diseases, conditions cannot necessarily be cured by the medical knowledge they have. So for example, this is when you see um, the huge push towards the prevention of blindness. They're not trying to cure it anymore, they're trying to stop it before it even starts. So I think that that ties in very much with this kind of the med medicine working sort of on a, with an economic model. Um, and, and of course, because the state apparatus is also increasing. And so therefore, they're going to work together um, to make sure that, that these industries are, are you know, viable and, and profitable as well. Um, as for the trade unions, um, I think it's a really interesting point you made about the war. Um, but I mean, I, I would think that that rhetoric was extremely important. Um, and I think they certainly were you know, far stronger than, for say, say, for example, trade unions are nowadays. And um, they certainly had an impact. And, and probably it may have been an impact that was maybe more location specific. <laughs> but I, I really couldn't say for, for sure. We've got to have one last question, so Ian. Yeah, the, the question has really, to a large extent, been asked uh, by Steve there, but um, uh, yeah, I was just thinking there, particularly as if I've got this right, that uh, during World War I, coal miners were perceived as a reserve occupation. Yes. Uh, my own grandfather signed up, and when they found out he was a miner, uh, he was sent back right away. He said, no, you need to be down in the pits. Um, and uh, therefore, when they get into the interwar period, Joanna Burke has shown her disability uh, was seen in a different way in the light of uh, disabled servicemen for a short while, um, and that maybe opened horizons a little bit. And you know, maybe by the mid 1920s, people's attention had moved off those as well. But I, I just wonder, does it come out in any kind of mining biographies how the miners felt about the attention on disabled servicemen, particularly since they had not been allowed to serve during World War One? Uh, you know, the, the events of 1926 suggest that uh, uh, they weren't considered uh, terribly important uh, uh, across the whole spectrum, and that includes the disabling factors. Um, comparisons, experiences? Mm, 
I think you see it more after the Second World War. I think you see um, a lot of rehabilitation services extended to workers. Um, I don't think you see it, I think you're correct, I, and so is Joanna, I, I don't think you really see it much after the, um, the First World War. And I think partly it's to do with this idea, you know, the Peter Hennessy, um, wonderful Peter Hennessy history, uh, never again. You know, this idea that this will not happen, you know, society will change fundamentally. And I think, and also because Britain becomes the foremost authority on rehabilitation after the um, Second World War. So it extends its rehabilitation methodology that it develops so well in the military because it's so necessary if you're fighting a war on several fronts in order to have enough people. So it's like, as I said in the book, it's like doing make and mend on the body. You know, you've got to try and get people to be, you know, fit. And you see it extending into coal mining, for example, very much so, um, and other um, industries with, you know, sort of high rates of accidents and, and injury, all of the kind of rehabilitative methods that are used in the war. But in the First World War, I would say probably you, not at all. Well, I think on a practical level as well, in the Second World War, uh, that's a time in which there's major labour shortages. In yes, the exactly. At a time when the coal industry is crucial to the rebuilding of a exactly. damaged economy, which is exactly. true the First yeah. World War. Well, yeah, in the First World War, it's the first couple of years after the war, there's more employment, and then psh, it goes completely down. Whereas, obviously, you know, even, even disabled people manage to keep their jobs that they actually took on in, in the war, like women in offices and things like that, who have disabilities. Um, you know, women, um, deaf women, for example, working in industry, they can often keep their jobs after the war because the necessity for labour is so very high. It's a good point. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, once again, Julie, for a wonderful uh, talk this evening, uh, which has uh, generated lots of uh, stimulating questions. So, I should thank Julie again. Thank you. Thank you.